Now, <clears throat> the fourth phase is, um, it's actually involves stretching the muscle. Um, there are a lot of people who have kind of pioneered stretching. Th this, th this part is, the, is the, one of the most intriguing parts of training because most of us that have applied it know there's a lot of benefit, but there is very little scientific data to back this up. They just, it's not because the studies haven't been good, they just haven't done them. I mean, if you go to any seminar where they're talking about stretching a muscle, they'll bring up the classic avian study with birds where they, I mean, that's all you hear. That's all there is, you know. Um, who did that, Lopez, or uh, what's his name? Uh, your friend, um, Spanish guy, one of your Spanish buddies, what's his name? Heck, no, not Hector, uh, the guy that did the bird study. Jose, Antonio. Jose Antonio. So he did, when was that? That was a long time ago. You go to any seminar now, that's the only thing they talk about on stretching a muscle. You know, but then you had John Perillo came along. I trained in the, in the 90s at John's facility in Cincinnati, and he was putting the crazy stretches on people. Now his technique was, um, what he would do was he would put you in a stretch position, and he would put it to where you could barely tolerate the pain and then he'd make you hold it for like 60 seconds. And then Dante came along, Dante Trudell, a, a super cool dude that did DC training, and Dante started kind of loading the stretches. He would like, let's say you're gonna stretch your tricep, he would make you hold a really heavy dumbbell and do it. So he kind of had his, his take on it. Um, uh, now, my theories um, on stretching is I look at the body part because certain body parts can be stretched a little differently than others. I don't necessarily like to load certain joints at certain angles. Like for instance, um, let's say your legs are really pumped and you want to do, let's say for instance, you wanted to sit in a squat position with a heavy weight on your back. I'm personally not a fan of that. I think in the long run, it's probably going to not be good for your knees. I personally don't like holding a 150 pound dumbbell over your head like this. I think in the long run, it's probably going to be hard on your elbows. So, but I do like to use, you could do it several different ways. You can use an exercise that gives you a really good full range of motion. Like for instance, a stiff legged deadlift your hamstring. That's something where you can use a really good full range of motion. You can really open the muscle belly up, really stretch. Okay. You could also just do a stretch where, like say your quads, you just put your foot up on a bench and you just drop down and push your hips out and stretch your quads. We all do that, right? That's another way. But if you make that stretch really hard and hold it for 30 seconds, that's another way of doing this. Then there's another way where you can do it against weight, like the way Dante does. And like, for instance, I might use that on chest. I might finish with a set of flies and then on the last rep, I might hold the fly position and really feel a stretch for like 30 seconds. It's brutally difficult, by the way. Um, and the, the advantage there too is you're toward the end of the workout, so you're not going to sit there and try to hold 100 pound dumbbells in a fly position and potentially tear your bicep or something like that. So it ha this stuff has to make sense. I, I just started getting back to um, the old, old school too of wearing a belt and adding weight and hanging from a chin up bar. I just started getting back to that too, and actually my lower back's feeling better. So maybe, that, maybe there's some decontraction there or something that helps. But Initially, I started doing all this stretching because I felt like it helped with recuperation. I felt like when I added the, the stretches that I was recovering faster. So that's initially why I put that in the last phase. But now there's, you know, there's a lot of theories. There's um, you know, splice variants of IGF-1, you know, mechano growth factor and all these things. And where if a muscle is fully, you know, fully stretched, there's some things that happen with protein synthesis. I don't know what's true and not true. I just feel like, I feel like it works. And ultimately my lab is the thousands of people that I've worked with over the years. That's my lab. So if they tell me something works, then I'm going to be happy to use it. But if they all tell me it sucked, then I'm probably going to scratch it for my program. So this is this little phased approach to how I approach body parts. And again, the reason was, was because I wanted to take advantage of every way you could create hypertrophy in a muscle. I didn't want to just get stuck on increasing weight or just get stuck on getting a pump. I wanted to, if there's something, if there's a way to make a muscle grow, I want to, I want to do it. 
So that's, that's kind of my mindset. And you can kind of see how all this stuff over the years, it kind of got tweaked so that this explosive stuff got moved here. And then after we, we got the heavy stuff out of the way, we've got the pump in. So it all, you see how that all log logically, it just flows together. So it's a training system. All right, <clears throat> questions before we move on? Yes, sir. John, have you ever played around with maybe adding a phase five, another pump action exercise? Because in my mind, after you open that valve up, you could probably get even more to it. Yeah, I mean, the question is, could you, do, could you go back after phase four and repeat phase three? I guess if you weren't real tired, you could. Uh, just at that point, I'm just pretty spent. But um, it's kind of cool because some muscles, you think, okay, they're done. I can't get any more blood in there. And then you do something else, and all of a sudden more blood comes in there. I'm like, whoa, maybe they weren't done. Um, you know, there's also some of that stretching you do in phase four. Also, you hear people talk about occlusion training. There's also an occlusion effect when your muscle is fully pumped and you're putting in the stretch. So, you know, that's another, that's another possible benefit. Um, occlusion training is something I used to do for people who had injuries. You couldn't train heavy. Um, that's when you see people like putting the bands around their arms or their legs and you know if it's if it's choking off slow twitch muscle fibers then fast twitch muscle fibers have to work so that way you can have the advantage of still using fast twitch muscle but not using the weight because you're hurt um, so that's the application I always use with occlusion training was it wasn't so much for growth it was for helping people that had a little banged up maybe or just a change every now and then but there is some occlusion effect when you're really putting a hard stretch on a pumped muscle. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I call these base workouts. So what I like to do is one base workout for your chest, one for your back, one for your legs. Arms are a little different. Arms, I scratch phase two. I don't see any reason to explode on a barbell curl, okay? We used to do that and all I saw was Lateral and medial epicondylitis, just tendonitis in your elbows. People with banged up elbows, that's what I saw. So I scratched it. I said, it makes no sense on arm training. But we would still do, we would still get a lot of blood and muscle and still stretch it. Um, and actually arm work is really cool. You get crazy blood in there, then you like to do a preacher curl where you can really stretch it or, you know, a tricep movement. You know, like when I started training as a teenager, when I walked in the gym, I remember all the guys doing arms would always start with skull crushers. And so that's how I train, but I always had beat up elbows. My elbows, man, I'm like in college and my elbows are killing me. I'm like, man, how bad is this going to be when I'm 30? So even then, there was something about exercise sequence that I knew something wasn't right. But what if you put them last? Now they don't hurt anymore. Now they feel great. You know, maybe you're not using quite as much weight, but you're still getting the stimulus for the movement and it's putting you in a good stretch position. So anyways, so... Chest, back, legs, all get this, arms, we cross out phase two. Shoulders, I usually pair with chest. Shoulders, I don't do a ton of overhead pressing. I don't do a ton of it. I just, I feel like if you're doing a lot of, I love, like I mentioned earlier, I love incline barbells. I absolutely love incline barbell pressing. That's, that is my favorite movement now. Um, I don't think you need to do a lot of overhead pressing, and I think you gotta be careful because of injuries and banged up shoulders you can get from that. I do love lateral variations. A lot of guys are doing those today. Um, I, what I see with a lot of people is their shoulders get even bigger when they start focusing on training different angles uh, for the different parts of their deltoid. So we don't do like, we don't do a lot of really heavy work on overhead pressing. All right, so. All right, now, so, okay, John, are you saying I only need to work a muscle once a week? No, not what I'm saying. I did that for probably the first 20 years of my bodybuilding career because that's what we did. We read that in the magazines, right? Lee Haney trained his back once a week. So I was gonna train my back once a week. That's what we all did. But I'm gonna be brutally honest with you and I'm gonna tell you that for most people, I don't like that. The reason why it works for most high-level bodybuilders is because of all the drugs involved in the sport. You can have the most ridiculous, stupid training program in the world, but if you respond really well to drugs, then it'll work for you. And then they go, see? See how great this is? Well, is it you or is it the drugs? 
Um, but I always tried to judge a lot of the successful program of how, worked, how well it worked with natural athletes. Um, so I believe that training a body part once a week probably, it's probably not enough, particularly if it's your strong body part. The interesting, here's the interesting thing about recovery. There's, um, you know when people talk about being genetically, um, people talk about being a, gene uh, a genetic freak, one of the first things I think of is their recovery to determine if they're a genetic freak or not. Because some people can take all the drugs in the world and they still can't recover with a crap. Then I get natural athletes that can recover just bam. So there's something just in their genetics or some, there's something that, I mean, I just see it over and over. You know, somebody who doesn't recover well, you can, they can use a certain amount of drugs and they still don't recover that well. So I don't necessarily say I don't necessarily assume someone's recovery is going to go off the chart um, if they enhance. It'll get better, but I've, I just see so many natural people. And I get a lot of questions from natural athletes on my training, like, will it still work for me? Um, yeah, yeah, as long as you can recover. Um, that's really the key to all this, because what we're going to get into with the high frequency stuff is really your number one focus. Will you get the stimulus in the gym? It's going to be to recover. Because the better you can recover, the quicker you can recover, the more sessions you can get, the more stimulus you're providing for the muscle. And that's how you really start maxing out your genetics. So how do you train the muscle part, a group second? How, did you, how would you do it the second time for the week then? Well, these are what I call pump workouts. And basically, we just take out that phase two part I was talking about. You just don't do the heavy stuff. And the reason why is because of your joints. You know, let's say you squatted real heavy on Monday and then you're doing your pump workout on Friday. I wouldn't let you squat real heavy. So in your mind, all you got to think is stay away from the really heavy things that could bang up my soft tissue and my joints. Basically, stay away from real heavy compound stuff. You can go crazy on them on, say, Monday. You want to work them hard. Those are the movements we love and we enjoy. But then, say, Friday... Um, when you're training that body part again, then the focus needs to become more on driving blood and just creating a stimulus in the muscle. So see how that works? So then in terms of, let me just simplify it even more for you now. So how many days rest would you have? If you take the, I like for people to have three days rest after the base workout. So if they did their base workout for chest, say on Monday, they would get three days and then on Friday would be their pump workout because then they would only have Saturday and Sunday to recover for Monday, but that's okay because that was just a pump workout. So three, so train a muscle, give it three days, and then hit it with a pump workout two days, and come back. Do you think that can help with recovery? I think it absolutely can help with recovery. It's a lot of a lot of people would just call that act, active recovery, right? Yeah, you're getting blood in there, you're getting fresh blood in there. Absolutely can help with recovery. Yes, sir. I've heard of like a feeder workouts in the evening where you feel less like very low weight of like bands and you just get a light pump, would that be excessive in this case or? Um, so the question was feeder workouts. <clears throat> feeder workouts are very low intensity, just designed to create a stimulus. I think that's fine. I do think there needs to be a certain level of intensity to create a stimulus. I mean, you can't just pick up a dumbbell and then two, do 10 reps and then throw it down and walk out and say, my job's done here. I mean. So you need, there needs to be a, it just depends on how hard the feeder workout is, 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 is my answer. Because I've seen them real, real easy. I wouldn't even call that a workout. I would almost, <laughs> that's more just kind of rehab work. <laughs> um, but the concept is to just create, again, it's to create another stimulus without beating the hell out of your joints. That's the concept, okay? Now, okay, let's talk about this is what I've been doing a lot of lately. Let's talk about the high frequency stuff. Um, usually when you go to high frequency discussions, you'll hear people talk about the, all the Eastern Bloc countries, the Bulgarians and the Russians and how they all train three times a day and squatted every single day every week. What they don't tell you is that probably 95% of those people that went into those programs crashed and burned and their bodies were destroyed and the only people left standing were the truly genetic elite. So, true? <laughs> I, mean, that's, I mean, that's 
how their philosophies were. We're going to weed out everybody until we have the absolute genetic elite. Um, I have a little different take on what frequency is as it applies to bodybuilding. I believe that I try to keep it at two muscle groups maximum if, if I'm trying to do high frequency. So what I mean by that is, for, for, okay, first of all, let me talk about the number. I call high frequency three workouts a week. So chest, if you did it like say Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I would call that high frequency. The other stuff I would just call it just my normal training. High frequency, you get an extra session. Now, <clears throat> you can't do an extra session on every single body part. You don't have enough time in a day. You end up like 95% of the Soviet guys and you probably get beat up and burn out. So how can you do this successfully? I like to do phases with body parts. So like for instance, your chest, I'll do it for four weeks. You'll do it three times for four weeks, your chest and your shoulders, so two body parts. Two body parts max, that's what I want you to get in your head. Two body parts max. Okay, so then once that's over, after four weeks, then maybe I'll come to back. And I'll say, okay, now we're gonna do our back for four weeks or five weeks or six. Back's a little unique. I think back you can do for six weeks for most people. There's so many different muscles in your back, so many different angles that you can train from. I think your back can handle a few more weeks of, of high frequency work. Then say you finish that and then you go to your legs. So everything else goes back to once a week, but now your legs are getting three times a week. So what we're doing is we're creating a little block of time for each body part where you can use high frequency. And the other body parts are kind of taking, um, <clears throat> they're kind of going into maintenance phase. And really I would, I would still put them on the classic structure that we did first, the four phases, but I wouldn't even do a pump workout for them. I would just do them once. And whatever you're really focused on is what gets hit three times. Now, um, the hardest part of high frequency training in my mind is pulling back on the intensity some. Because let's say you're training your legs Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You can't absolutely destroy them Monday, Wednesday, and Friday like what we would do in one of those classic workouts. So you have to dial back the intensity a little. And this is where, this is where um, powerlifters are way ahead of bodybuilders. Powerlifters use these RPE scales the perceived exertion scales. And basically what they say is, if you think you have one rep left in the tank, we'll call that a nine. If you wanna leave two or three reps in the tank, we'll call that an eight. Powerlifting has done an awesome job with that. So, um, but bodybuilders have no concept of that. But you need to apply that for hypertrophy when you're using this high frequency stuff. You can't always train at a 10. You can't go to failure on every single thing you do. You have to pull back a little because again, you're creating an, you don't have as much recovery and you're just trying to create a stimulus. Very intensity or are they all the same, they're all six? Or? So great question. The question is, okay, so in those three workouts, let's, let's assume Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The question the sweet ass is, do you vary the intensity? Now, how many, re how many days rest on Monday? Okay, you say you train Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. When you train Wednesday, how many days rest did you have? You only had one, right, Tuesday. When you trained Friday, how many days rest did you have? You only had one, you only had Thursday. When you trained Monday, how many did you have? You had two. So you're doing a little more on Friday. Yes, so on Friday, when you get to two days rest, that's when you can turn it up a notch. I get stuck in this seven day a week mentality just because I had a corporate job, so everything for years revolved around working for the weekend. Um, but Julia's question was, okay, what if you didn't do a seven day week? What if you wanted to make it eight days? You could do that for two reasons. You could do it for one, if the person can't recover fast enough, even because some people just don't have good recovery. They just don't. Okay, so you could apply that. You could give them an extra day and you could spread it out over eight days. The other thing is, what if you have someone who has a really hard time pulling back and they want to train with a little more intensity? Then you could do that as well because you're giving them a little more recovery. The thing you have to figure, the thing you have to realize with high frequency training is we don't have unlimited recovery. We just don't. That's why the other body parts have to take a back seat. You only train them once a week so that the, whatever you're hitting with high frequency, you can put a lot more effort into that. That's the whole point of doing it. You're trying to improve something. And I love it because you have these really awesome, exciting blocks of four or five weeks where you're just going crazy on a muscle. And then when it starts to kind of get a little burnt out or tired, then you're on to the next muscle group. So let's take, for example, someone with really good legs. Okay, I, I basically have a chest and shoulder 
block, a leg block, and a back block. So let's say their legs were phenomenal. They didn't need a leg block. So what I would probably do is I would do chest and shoulders, then back, then I would come back to chest and shoulders, and then back, and then chest and shoulders. So I would completely eliminate the block they didn't need. So it is based on weakness. Yeah, see, and that's how I apply it to the bodybuilders I'm working with. Like, let's say a guy has an awesome back. He's never going to do the back phase. He's going to be doing the, he's going to be doing the other phases. So that's how, you, that's how you would customize that for somebody who, you know, had some really strong areas. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. See, I, I kind of have my own RPE chart. We have, um, when you use all the multiple high intensity techniques of drop sets and all that, creating the ISO holds and partials, I call that a 13. And so every once in a while, you'll take somebody up to a 13. You did a 13 today. Um, okay, this is just so you can see it. Sometimes it helps people just to see how it looks on a screen. But in this case, um, I actually had chest and back, and this program was the two body parts I wanted to focus on. Chest back, chest back, and chest back. So you can see right here, there's two days off. So the Wednesday was actually the hard day. Going back to what Swede was asking, the days aren't all the same, so a little bit harder here. Then the Saturday and the Monday, we pull back a little bit in the RPE chart, pull back on the intensity a little bit, but they're getting hit three times there. I, do, I did want to talk a little bit about weak body parts because I get that question a ton. Um, so when I hear um, weak body parts, there's a couple things that come to mind. So first of all, I always think to myself, how is their exercise execution? You always hear people say, I can only feel my triceps and my front delts when I do chest. I can't feel my chest. I hear a lot of people say that. So what I need to do to be able to answer them, okay, what would happen, let's say they had really crappy form. What would happen if I told them to just train their chest more often? What do you think would happen? No, they're just doing more bad stuff. So that makes no sense. So the first thing you have to do with your clients is you have to figure out why can't they feel their chest? So if you can watch them execute exercises and you can see that they're not establishing that mind-muscle connection that we talked about in phase one, if, they, if they're not good at that, then they need a lot of time in that phase. They gotta figure out, you gotta help them solve feeling that muscle. Now we have some little tricks that we use like on chest we'll throw a band behind our back and we'll just sit there and squeeze a band and we'll do like 10 sets to really activate our chest and then we'll do a set. Pretty much works for everybody. That's an example of something that you could do with somebody that would help them feel that muscle. Um, whatever it is they need to do to feel that muscle is the answer. So let's say they can't feel their quads when they squat. Maybe you throw out, maybe you then maybe you do get out of the box a little bit and you do the leg extensions first and you know, put a lot of strain on their quads and fatigue them a little bit and then put them under the squat bar because then they probably will feel their legs more. Whatever it is you need to do, the goal is to make sure that they're establishing the mind-muscle connection, they can feel strong contractions. That's the first problem you solve. Now, once you solve that, then give it some time. See if, they're, see if it's still a weak part or see if they're making progress because you may not need any higher frequency. That may have been what they needed right there. Okay, let's say you do that, you give them six weeks and it, it helped, but you want to do more. Then you could add in this high fre higher frequency stuff. You could go to two days a week using the classic style, which is a base workout and then a pump workout. Or you could try the high frequency stuff where they're hitting it three times. Not, one is not better than the other. They're just different. So conquering a, a weak body part, you, first you got to really see how they execute movements. You got to make sure they're doing stuff right because you can add any amount of reps or volume you want but making them do the wrong stuff over and over and over doesn't help. Make sense? Because really the answers you get most of the time is people just say, well, I'm just going to train it more. But that's not, that's not always the right answer. I love to talk about calves, so I'm a calf fanatic. Dave and I were wondering, like, 